I'm just waiting for the recording thing to pop up. If it has. Okay. okay. Here it is. All right. In a study done by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, it was reported that one in five children from the ages of nine to 17 were living with a mental health disorder that led to impairment in uh, health daily functioning. And this is from Beagle, Brown, Shapiro, and Schumer in 2009, page 856. In 2016, I became part of this statistic when I was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder and an anxiety disorder. And this has led to me wanting to become an advocate for those who live with mental health issues. Because of this diagnosis, I studied the topic of toxic stress and stress uh, the past fall semester, and I felt the need to open up a dialogue on this conversation. It's imperative that we always try to improve the lives and experiences of others, and that's why I'll be discussing this topic today. Toxic stress is a subject largely um, uh, ignored, yet needs to be explored in order to help those that have it and to help uh, prevent others from developing it. So today in this speech, we'll be discussing what toxic stress is and two solutions on how to help people prevent toxic stress from happening. And so we will examine what toxic, yeah, we will examine what toxic stress is. So before we begin, let's discuss the difference between stress and toxic stress. So toxic stress is a serious issue overlooked and misunderstood by society. Knowing the difference between stress and toxic stress can help seek the approach, can help you seek the appropriate care. And stress comes from allostasis or the ability to detect environmental, external, and psychological internal changes and uh, activate adequate responses. And this is from Denise McIrwin in 2012, page 30. Whereas toxic stress defined by Toth in 2016, paragraph 13, is defined as unrelieved activation of the body uh, stress management system due to strong, frequent, or prolonged adversity, such as um, physical and emotional abuse, neglect, extreme poverty, exposure to um, violence and other traumatic events without adequate adult support. And this is, so stress is your evolutionary response to stimuli, whereas toxic stress is this heightened, prolonged stimuli to stress. And toxic stress physically alters how your brain reacts to stress. And that's why it's such a serious issue. And this goes into my next point, um, that there is a correlation between toxic stress and uh, future uh, psychological issues. And so there's no cause, like definite cause and effect between the two, but there is this, um, it is seen that those who have toxic stress have an increased likelihood of developing future psychological problems like mental health disorders, like anxiety and depression. And that's why it's such a serious issue. Now that we've examined the severity of toxic stress, let's discuss intervention work. Intervention work aims to lessen some of the effects of toxic stress and to provide coping skills. So intervention work should be implemented at all levels of schooling. This means primary, um, middle school, and high school levels of schooling. And this is to give kids coping skills and management skills with different experiences that they're going to have throughout their time. And one of the most effective, no, well-known intervention programs is called mindfulness training. And mindfulness training focuses on introspection uh, to understand emotional reactions to experiences in order for kids to have better coping skills. And so this is seen when students talk about their experiences, how they reacted, and then talking about other kids' experiences and how they reacted in order for kids to understand um, better ways for them to react to certain things in the future. And so intervention programs implemented at all levels of schooling can benefit everyone. They don't just benefit students that have psychological problems. They help everybody. Having coping skills and management skills is imperative for everyone because we're all going to have different experiences throughout our lives where we're going to need them. And so intervention work is just one of the two positive, possible solutions for toxic stress. Perhaps the most effective yet arduous solution for toxic stress is prevention. It could be prevented... Um, Toxic stress could be prevented if policy changes were made to protect the welfare of children and were implemented into the legal system. So this looks like having after school programs so that students that have um, toxic uh, environments and harmful environments at home can get away from that and that students during like legal battles and stuff like that can have um, accessible, affordable access to therapists and things like this so that they can like ward off the development of toxic stress. And so here in Wyoming, there's a few laws in place to protect and ensure the livelihood of victims. Uh, the Wyoming Victims Bill of Rights was passed in 1991, and it lists off the rights and protections of victims by law. And the first one states the right to be treated with compassion, respect, and sensitivity throughout the criminal justice system. And this is from Wyoming's Division of uh, uh, Victim Services, paragraph 5. And so what we see, though, is there's no real um, policies within there to help student help kids and to help people that are going through these things. So the reason why solution, solutions are so hard is because there needs to be policy change. And again, this is 
not something that's easy to come by. So there needs to be policy change in Wyoming, within our county in Laramie or Albany, and in other states. And so to seek real change in both uh, prevention and for intervention work, it should be carried out to alleviate and diminish the long-lasting effects of toxic stress. Now let's review what we've discussed. Toxic stress is just one thing millions live with, and we have the ability to help. Today we examine what toxic stress is and the possible solutions for toxic stress, which are prevention and intervention. Toxic stress doesn't have to be a final diagnosis. Um, it, there needs to be like a network of support for those that have it. And there should, uh, a conversation needs to be open so that we can see the end of toxic stress. It is our duty to give the younger generations the keys to thrive. Good job. Yay. <laughs> All right, Austin. Good. Hi, my name is Austin Anderson, and today I'll be talking about kneecap dislocations, what they are, how they can be destructive, and treatments to these type of injuries. Have you ever had a knee dislocation yourself? Maybe you haven't, or maybe you have seen other people have them, or maybe your kids someday will have them. According to Hamstra, Kirschlock, and Lafave in the article Assessment of Demographics and Pathiotomic Risk Factors in Reoccurrent patellofemoral instability, they discuss that knee dislocations are much more likely to happen to children and adolescents who are just growing up and going through their growing process. I personally experienced my first kneecap this 14 years old playing basketball. I didn't know what it was or how to treat it or exactly where to even go for help when I needed it. So that brings me to our first point of just what a kneecap dislocation is. A kneecap dislocation is when the knee sort of goes in and the kneecap goes the opposite direction, bringing it out of its natural grooves. And that can cause many problems to your medial patellofemoral ligament, which is discussed according to Panay, Vesso, and Cecilio in the article, What to Do, 94 to 100% of kneecap dislocations occur with a MPFL rupture. And it can also occur with just stretching out that ligament. And so when that ligament is basically stretched out, it won't cause internal bleeding. So this type of injury, you can have 20 of them and it can just keep stretching out and it won't ever swell and you can think nothing's wrong and you can go back to your daily life the next day. And the MPFL's purpose is to hold that kneecap in place. So the more and more dislocations you have, the more that's just gonna keep being stretched out and getting more and more uh, ruptured, so to speak, that it's just gonna make, pose further problems in the future. Now, my personal experience with kneecap dislocations, it just kept happening and happening and happening. And so, I, but I didn't have that swelling and bleeding, which brings me to how this type of injury can be so destructive and reoccurring. So, Pene, Verso, and Cecilia state in their article what to do that patellar re-dislocations after the first episode completely relies on the damage of that medial patellofemoral ligament. So the more you damage that, the more likely you are to keep having one. And after the second one, you're more likely to have a third one and so on. So every time the kneecap is displaced, it breaks, a, breaks cartilage underneath the kneecap in those grooves that can cause a future of problems with arthritis. And basically after so many dislocations, you're not gonna have any cartilage and there is no surgery that is found yet to replace that cartilage in your knee. So once it's gone, it's gone forever. And now that you know that the kneecap can be, the kneecap dislocation can be super destructive, let's talk about some of the treatments that can help these type of injuries. Now the first and most successful they call is an MPFL reconstruction, which is basically just a harvesting of the hamstring, which a little small ligament they'll take from your own hamstring and then reconstruct that ligament in hopes of making it stronger. And also they have a tibia tubercle osteotomy, which is basically your kneecap attaches to your shin bone with a tendon that can be out of line depending on just the anatomy of your body. And so the goal of that surgery is to move that ligament over, however, straighten that alignment, and then they screw it back in, and then they hope that'll prevent the kneecap dislocation. And none of these are 100% reliable. And some people also that don't want surgery just want to do physical therapy and strengthen their quads and hamstrings 
to hold that kneecap in place, but that is the most unreliable way and almost is never effective. So basically the only way to take care of this type of injury is through surgery. So let's review what we've talked about today. Kneecap dislocations may not seem relevant to you or think that you're never going to have any issues with them, but knowing these facts of what knee dislocations are, the, how they can be destructive and the treatments to these can help you so much in the future. And I wish personally, I would have known these things and maybe I could have prevented myself from having all the surgeries and injuries I did. Thank you. Good job. Not too bad in a group, right? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Huh? I didn't, I didn't hear. Not too bad in a group, right? Oh, okay. No. <laughs> hey, Connor, say a sentence of something. Hi, I am Connor. <laughs> That's okay. It was going like in and out on my computer of your voice. It'll get like quiet and loud, but I it'll do that for me for you too, Connor. Like it'll go in and out. Can you hear me if I'm just talking like this normally and just making stuff up as I talk? You just get and quiet out. and louder. You were, it's always been like that. Is your mic on your computer? Uh, yeah, I think it's just built in. I mean, I don't have like one hooked up. It's okay. We can always hear you. It's yeah, just, good. you just get loud and quiet without, and you're not doing it. It's just the connection. Oh, well, I don't really know how to fix it. It's so. okay. We can hear you. And you'll see what we mean when you watch the recording. Okay. Okay. Um, no worries, though. All right. Whenever you're ready. Okay. A young boy walks into a hospital room. On the bed is a man. The man is motionless except for his slow rhythmic breathing. The boy walks up to the man and takes his cold, lifeless hand. The boy says, hi, Grandpa. The hand twitches because the man knows who is there, but he cannot respond. The boy begins to cry. Just hours ago, this was the man that he had gone on countless fishing trips with, explored the mountains with, and played catch with. I was that young boy. My grandpa had a stroke and killed him when I was young. On average, every 40 seconds, someone in the United States has a stroke, and someone dies of one approximately every four minutes, according to a study done by the American Heart Association in 2016. Today, I'm going to inform you about medical strokes, including the internal causes, the warning signs, and the treatment. First, we're going to Discuss what internally causes a stroke. According to a study done by Mayo Clinic in 2016, a stroke occurs when blood flow is lost to the brain. There are two different types. The first type is an ischemic stroke, which accounts for about 85% of them. This is when a blood clot forms somewhere in the brain, blocking blood flow to another part. The second form of a stroke is a hemorrhagic stroke. These are more serious they only account for about 15% of strokes. This is when a blood vessel in your brain actually bursts, and they're more serious because it causes internal bleeding in the head. article titled, What is a Stroke and What are the Symptoms? Done in 2004. When blood flow is blocked, the oxygen begins to deplete. When this happens, the brain starts to die. The brain function is lost. And therefore, whatever bodily controls are given by that part of the brain are also lost. So now let's look at the warning signs. So according to WebMD, in, published in 2016, when a stroke occurs, the following warning signs are given. There is generally weakness or numbness in one side of the body, especially in the face, hands, and legs. There's a loss of vision in one or both of the eyes. There's difficulty speaking or understanding simple phrases and words. There's a headache may or may not have any known cause. And a loss of balance or trouble walking. Mayo Clinic summarizes these in a simple, easy to remember acronym, which is FAST. It stands for Face, Arms, Speech, 
in time. If the victim's face droops or they're unable to use half of their face, this is a sign. If the arms do not work as they usually do, this is also a sign. If their speech is slurred or they can't understand speech, that is also a sign. The last one is time, and that brings us into our final piece of information, which is the treatment. According to Cook, CK, and Clements, published in 2011, Time is vital when someone has a stroke. The only way to cure a stroke is to get them to medical attention as soon as possible because the only way to stop a stroke is to restore blood flow to the brain. So you must get them to a hospital. Once at the hospital, they do a cerebral angiography and other medical scans to decide what blood vessels are blocked or ruptured. Then they take medical procedures such as, in the worst case, surgery, or sometimes in a smaller stroke, they can use blood thinners and other medicines to get the blood flowing again. Let's review what we've talked about. Strokes are a serious medical condition that affect many people, especially in the United States. I hope that none of you have to be the little boy that I was because we have discussed internal causes, the warning signs, and treatments of a stroke, and maybe one day you could save a life. Good job. Everyone was on time this time. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, any questions? I'm gonna stop recording really quick.